I'll give just a second to sit out Shu, who's going to moderate a discussion about Chinese outbound M&A, particularly outbound M&A into the United States, which has been a particular issue for a number of reasons, and we've discussed some of those earlier on today. And immediately afterwards, we're going to be hearing from our colleague Robert Ward, who's going to talk to us about the outlook for the Eurozone, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So thank you very much. Um, just a couple of final things. In your pack, um, you'll find that there's a... Um, uh, voucher um, about an upcoming conference that we have here next month at our China Summit. Uh, for everyone who's attending today, there's 20% off the cost of attending that summit if you're interested. And again, just to remind you that if you have specific sectors that you're interested in, please visit the stands that we have outside because we do have sectoral information both about China and other countries in the world. Um, it wasn't appropriate just to do that today in the presentation because clearly many of you are from different industries, but we do have analysis on sectors across China China and outside of China as well, so if you need to know more about that, please visit our stands. Uh, and now I'll hand over to Sita. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, many of you uh, attended the morning session, um, the discussion led by Tao Jinzhou. Um, the perspective really coming from China, Chinese perspective, Chinese companies, lessons, success in European market, other places, um, domestic constraints, and certain complicated issues uh, involving big state-owned enterprises. Um, the session um, uh, with Bill is actually about opening up the U.S. market and, of, of course, um, some of the historical perspective. Uh, Bill um, Rosoff uh, is a, a senior partner of Ozan O'Connor. Uh, that's a Chicago-based uh, law firm. Um, Bill really um, ha has done many things in his life. Uh, he, he, he's a wearing uh, quite a few hats, a very serious uh, lawyer uh, and, uh, and executive. Um, you may have noticed at one point he was uh, general counsel of RJ and Nabisco, and that, that was one of the most famous uh, hostile takeover uh, cases uh, in the United States, I believe um, um, it was in 1989, and, and quickly uh, Bill's, your partner actually became the CEO of RJ and Nabisco afterwards. And since then, he has been working in other uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies as a general counsel. Uh, in the past uh, few years, you know, really, I don't want to bore the audience, and involving with um, two or three leading uh, US law firms. Um, uh, what's quite important, I, I really want to point this out, um, Bill uh, spent a lot of time uh, with Japanese companies in the 80s. When they were looking at the US market, I think during our conversation, you said some of the motivations really just a trophy investment. And I think we've seen some similarities between Japan yesterday uh, and China today. Uh, of course, you are going to tell us um, uh, timing is very much different. Uh, anyway, I will leave this to you. So, so Bill, you, you, you have roughly 10 minutes um, just to um, give the audience a perspective of the U.S. market. And of course, um, what China can learn from Japan's success and failures. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you everything you need to know about us m and in the next 10 minutes. Um, actually, it'll take a little longer than that. Uh, back in the 80s, I actually did spend quite a bit of time um, giving presentations to Japanese bankers and businessmen about what they called U.S. M&As. Uh, it was one word, M&As. And that's sort of all they really cared about. And eventually they started doing some deals. Um, it was great work for lawyers because I represented a number of companies uh, acquiring U.S. businesses in the uh, mid and late 80s. And then I represented those same companies selling those businesses in the early 90s. So it was, it was great. Um, it's a very different world today, and while there, I think, are a few lessons to, uh, perhaps to be learned, uh, I think the risk of overgeneralizing is pretty great. Um, and I will just say that as you look back, some of the most successful Japanese investments in the United States were not M&As at all, but really greenfield or brownfield investments. And you think about the auto companies, for example, that have done very well. Um, and I think that's true today. We talk about outbound M&A, uh, but there are all sorts of ways that Chinese companies can uh, invest in the United States uh, beside doing a merger or acquisition. Uh, there are greenfields investments in many states. Um, 
have departments that are encouraging capital investment by Chinese and other foreign companies and providing all sorts of tax incentives. And that is often a way uh, that foreign investors and Chinese investors can get into the market uh, in a perhaps less dramatic, but in some ways more meaningful way. Um, I will say one other, le one significant lesson from the Japanese that is very important today is I think in some ways the biggest challenge for Japanese companies was not so much in acquiring the business, it was in actually managing it once they acquired it. And that remains true today. I think for any Chinese company uh, acquiring a business in the U.S., how to manage it from afar is one of the great challenges. And there's a tremendous balance between, on the one hand, uh, controlling the company that you just paid hundreds, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for, uh, but at the same time understanding that U.S. managers have an important role uh, to play. And how you incentivize them and compensate them is, is an issue that I think is often uh, not really thought about until it's almost too late. Those are issues that really need to be thought about before it is done. Um, one of the things that really has changed uh, since back in the 80s and 90s is, of course, greater sensitivity to national security. Uh, we've heard about CFIUS this morning. Uh, you, all, you all know about CNUC. Um, in some ways, I think that's both overstated and understated. Uh, if your name is Huawei, I think you can forget about a deal. You just have to change your name before doing a deal in the U.S. But um, other than that, there are a few areas that are particularly sensitive in defense industries and high tech. Um, but most, a lot of the transactions that have failed have failed not because of the technical Exxon Florio CFIUS rules, but because of political opposition. I think one of the great challenges for Chinese companies in particular uh, is dealing with the politics of any acquisition, particularly one that is uh, large and um, going to be on the front page of a newspaper. Uh, it's particularly true of Chinese companies because so many of them are, of course, state-owned, uh, and there is a great sensitivity in the U.S. and actually special rules on Decifius uh, requiring extra investigation of state-owned companies. Um, but that doesn't mean a deal can't get done, and I think a lot of the deals that have failed uh, have failed because of a lack of preparation. This is really an orchestration. It's not just lawyers uh, doing their legal thing. It's public relations people, it's lobbyists, it's people dealing with the government. The one thing that politicians in the U.S. hate and probably like politicians all over the world, is a surprise. Um, and one of the keys is making sure that before any acquisition is done, you orchestrate informing them and letting them into the process so that they can feel they can almost take ownership of, ownership of it, and in some cases perhaps even take credit. And um, it's the surprise that really can often do my transaction. So I guess if there's one takeaway, I'd say, you have to plan, and it's not just a legal issue, it's not just a financial issue, it's a political, it's a public relations issue. Um, but we in the United States, you know, it's, it's great for me to come over here. I'm here once or twice a year. I work in New York, and um, I like to, and I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, mergers and acquisitions by Chinese companies and hoping that uh, we get to see a lot more than we've seen. But, one of the interesting things for me to come over here is to, to see how small the U.S. is in the Chinese horizon of uh, I mean, the day-to-day was spent looking at other areas. Now, I think of the U.S. as the center of the world, but it's obviously not. Um, but I do think it is an area where there are going to be great opportunities. Uh, I think the macroeconomics are very different today than they were in the 80s. And, um, there were a lot of trophy acquisitions. I think what's going to drive acquisitions today is less, less that and more things like access to intellectual property, in some cases actually access to learning of uh, management and organizational skills will drive a number of Chinese companies uh, to make investments in the U.S. And despite the politics, uh, I think we are going, we are coming to a point, and in fact President Obama recently 
and made a speech about this, of really trying to find ways to encourage Chinese and other foreign investments uh, in the United States because we need the capital, uh, and in some cases we need the skills. Uh, we have the technology, we have some of the management skills, but there are a whole lot of other things uh, where we could really uh, use help, and infrastructure being a, a key one. So I'm going to stop there, and um, hopefully you'll have some questions, or, or you will, uh, we can continue the discussion. Sure, 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 let's continue this conversation. Bill, I have a few questions, but I also want to open up the floor. First of all, can you just tell us, what is the general perception of the Chinese companies in the U.S.? I know it's difficult to generalize. Right now, it's a, what's the general perception? Uh, it really is very difficult to generalize. I think the general perception uh, among, and I'm going to say something outrageous, among those people that one should care about, uh, as opposed to, you know, the Tea Party, who one shouldn't care about, uh, is uh, really awe at what the Chinese have done. And in fact, perhaps an overestimation of the of the skills of Chinese companies, which have done great work here, but not necessarily overseas. Um, so I think, I wouldn't say it's so much fear, I'd say it's, it's awe. Uh, there's obviously sensitivity to uh, the fact that so many of the large companies are state-owned. Um, but I think there's an expectation that the Chinese will play an increasingly important role uh, in the United States, notwithstanding all of the discussion and about the currency and a lot of the sideshows that one sees today. Yeah, uh, just by um, looking at some of the data, you know, some of the data, for example, um, the report produced by Asia Society, Peterson Institute, and these people were vocal promoting Chinese uh, direct investment in the United States. Data suggesting right now still very little Chinese investment outstanding in the U.S. From your perspective, is the U.S. more or less open to Chinese investment than, let's say, continental Europe? Uh, or uh, Great Britain? I, I don't know that, I think we're equally open. Uh, I think it varies a lot from industry to industry. Uh, it really does. Uh, there are some industries where we are going to be more sensitive, but other industries where we would welcome Chinese investment. Uh, everyone has been reading about the expected wave of outbound investment, and um, we have a whole, at our law firm, I, I run a team uh, that's waiting for just that investment, and we're still waiting, I have to say, uh, but it'll come, I think. Okay. I would like to ask um, the, the audience questions. Yes, Ambassador Wang, yes. Uh, microphone. Other questions? Yes. Um, I, I just wait for a second. The microphone. It's a very big room. Um, in the very beginning, you said uh, that one of the biggest problems is the management of the assets or the uh, companies overseas. And then you mentioned that compensating the managers was an issue. But you didn't, and, and nor have we throughout the day discussed national culture. How? how how important is it, or, or is it not important, that the national cultures are, you know, coming together in that business? I think it's critically important, and I'm going to, again, make another generalization, but I hope, since we only have a half hour, you'll allow me to make a few. Um, one of the differences I see between today and Chinese acquisitions in the U.S. and the Japanese acquisitions back in the 80s is that um, there is much more, all the differences, there is much more cultural compatibility between the Chinese and the Americans than there were in the 80s between the Japanese and the Americans. And I, find, I think the Japanese were very much isolated uh, 
And that's less true of the Chinese. And for one thing, if nothing else, there's so much back and forth in terms of education and jobs. And I mean, the number of people in this room, I'm sure, who have spent time uh, either being educated in the U.S. or working in the U.S. and coming back and vice versa, um, means that while the cultures are different, there's a much more of an understanding. But it's still 10,000 miles away, and Chinese companies are, for the most part, run in very different ways than U.S. companies. And for a Chinese owner to be successful, they're going to have to understand that they're going to have to run the company in a different way, and balancing the management of that uh, is, is a challenge. Now, uh, Bill, given this uh, uh, sharp learning curve, do you think right now Chinese companies initially maybe should um, should maybe to try to be a passive investor at this juncture? You know, I think that again, it, there's passive investment, and there's there's so many different ways of defining passive yeah. investment. Um, the Japanese were passive investors and lost a lot of money because they gave, you know, they had no control. And I think to be a, I, I wouldn't call it passive, I think minority investor is perhaps a better word, uh, with some rights um, on the board, in management, in operations as a way of, of learning. I think that's perfectly appropriate, or perhaps even on a joint venture basis that's appropriate. But being a passive investor, uh, you know, it's either a good investment or a bad investment. Uh, Bill, um, this room actually uh, is full of uh, practical people, a lot of business people involved in the uh, nuts and bolts operation. Um, probably you can uh, um, just give a few examples other than infrastructure, for example, Chinese companies building subway in the United States, power station. What other sectors you, you really see you know, potential uh, rapid explosive growth for Chinese investment? Well, and, and given political constraint, and take that sure. as a given. Well, of course, one that, that will be obvious and has been in the news is an alternative energy. Um, I think there will be great opportunities. You've all read about Solyndra, which went bankrupt. Uh, and I don't know the full story, I'm not sure anyone does, but in part it was because of of competition and inefficiency relative to uh, uh, to Chinese and other other manufacturers. So I think there are going to be great opportunities in uh, solar, wind, and other alternative energy sources. Um, I also think, and I'm, I'm now, you know, I'm just a lawyer, so I'm going beyond my, my field of expertise in a room that's full of experts. Um, you know, we heard the figure 10% earlier today, I think it was 10%, yes, 10 of the deals that are looked at are actually done. Um, there's another figure that I think it may be less than 10%. Um, all of the iPhones and iPads that are in this room are manufactured here, obviously, well, at least most of the components. And something like, I think it's actually less than 10% of the value, uh, the value chain actually uh, stays in China. Um, the rest goes through distribution and software, and engineering, and innovation, and whatever. Um, given where China is, I would think that over time, moving up the value chain and getting more of a share of the value of the products uh, that are in fact manufactured here is going to be something that will inevitably, inevitably happen. I'm not suggesting uh, that there will be a Chinese takeover of, of Apple computer anytime soon, but uh, I think there may be other opportunities to, to make those sorts of investments. Um, well, U.S. is a big country just like China. Uh, based on my uh, just superficial understanding, there, there are a lot of diversities in different states. Um, if I were a Chinese businessman right now asking you questions, um, I mean, with all different macroeconomies, drivers in different states, you said don't listen to Tea Party. Now, in which area, you know, which state, 
you, you think, you know, really the uh, open door policy may, may become more liberal. Um, maybe you can even talk about U.S. Uh, we, based on different geography. We have a very, what I'll call, schizophrenic system. On the one hand, we have federal regulation, uh, like uh, CFIUS, Exxon Florio, or Hart Scott Rodino, the NHS regime. That's all federal, and that, those are all there to review and, in some cases, block acquisitions. At the state level, just about every state, too, I mean, most states, have agencies that are doing just the opposite. They're out there every day encouraging uh, Chinese and other investments. There's actually uh, the home state of, of my law firm is Pennsylvania. Well, Pennsylvania has a very active program, including uh, someone here in Beijing, as well as several people in Shanghai, who spend their time encouraging um, both consumption of Pennsylvania exports, but importantly, from my point of view, and relevant to today, encouraging investment in factories and greenfield investment in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, New York State has a similar program, uh, providing tax incentive and other incentives. And, you know, even at the federal government level, there's, you probably heard about the EB-5 program, which is a way of encouraging investment through essentially selling, selling visas. Um, so at the state level, just about every state uh, encourages and wants investors who are going to provide jobs. Mm. Good. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question over there. Yes, uh, microphone. Uh, my name is Chin Chun Kang from the Chinese Academy of Engineering. I think, uh, uh, you see, 30 years ago, China was one of the most closed nations in the world. And now, China has become one of the most open societies, like the United States. And uh, the relations between the U.S. and China has become stronger and stronger today to have developed into a stage that the uh, United States has become more sensitive to China's enterprises to enter into the United States. I think one of the major reasons is the mutual, lack of mutual understanding. This is my uh, uh, judgment, my, my observation. I think Chinese people are a very fast learning uh, nation, and the learning people. But on the other hand, I think the U.S. Uh, American people seem to be a little bit uh, slower in truly understanding the real situation in China. Uh, for instance, nowadays, we're at least a, hundreds, a few hundred thousand Chinese scholars and students are in the United States, if not a million. But now there are few American people coming to China to really understand China. So my question is, uh, uh, Bill, uh, if this could be changed in the near future, and in such a trend of change, if the U.S. companies can join hands with U.S. universities to bring more young American people to come to China, to learn about China, really understand China, so that the relationship between the two peoples in the future would become better off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm actually encouraged that that is in fact happening. It may not be happening quickly enough, but you know, in NYU, which is a major university based in New York, uh, is opening a campus uh, in Pudong, in, in Shanghai, and other universities. You are, actually, your alma mater already has a uh, uh, East Asia Center in Beijing, right? Uh, University of Chicago has a uh, new campus led by five Nobel Prize uh, laureates. I, I mean universities, American universities, they have to be global universities. Uh, there is a, a push for yeah. the US, uh, U.S. universities to become, well, and that's the word they use, is global. Um, I was uh, at Tsinghua University yesterday and gave a, a lecture to a bunch of students and Tsinghua has a program with uh, a law school in Philadelphia, Temple, uh, as do other universities. So I completely agree with you, and I think uh, I'm encouraged that that is happening more. Uh, you know, there are now some public schools in, in uh, New York City uh, where the language uh, is everything, the sessions are in Chinese. And it's not just Chinese students, this is for for uh, New Yorkers who are born there, uh, they want to learn Chinese and they're going to schools that uh, speak Mandarin. Yeah, it's changing, it's changing. I think uh, on that note, 
uh, we should just uh, wrap up today's discussion. Um, thank you for your perspective. Um, clearly, this perspective could only be derived from uh, uh, from serious experience, extensive experience dealing with uh, overseas investment. I do hope China can avoid some of the mistakes made by Japan, and that would make everyone uh, better off. Thank you. Well, I hope so too, and uh, you know, I hope we can be a part of, of making that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.